Southpod, Rise of a Region, hosted by Stanfield Gray and John Yarian. Greetings and welcome to South Pod. I'm your host, John Yerian, and we're coming to you from the Dig South Conference itself. We're inside the mothership of The Thing in sunny Charleston, South Carolina. And I am joined by Jeremy Brody, and Jeremy works for Under Armour, and I'm thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And the first thing we got to work on, I, typically when I introduce guests, we do like the full title be clear on what that individual does. There's some confusion around yours. I have something in my notes that's wrong. You handed me a business card that's also wrong. Yes, yes. What, what is your official title? Well, I like to say my official title is really dad, but uh, outside of that, at work, I've had many over the years, but the, uh, the reality is um, I oversee all of our partnerships in the entertainment space. So the fancy okay. title that they go, that they've given me is Director of Strategic Partnerships and Entertainment. Okay. But I, if I recall correctly, I've had that position for a while. The reason why strategic's not on there is because, well, just visually it's too many damn words. So, it is a lot of words. Yeah. So help maybe give us an example of a partnership or, or something out of your day-to-day -day that decodes that a little bit. I mean, what does that really look like managing those partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're an athletic apparel and footwear brand, uh, obviously very heavily involved in the connected fitness space as well. And I'm kind of charged with finding some opportunities and partnerships of, that we can work with that help promote the Under Armour message, help promote the brand but really help get amplified by additional partnerships. So things that are live outside of the sport world very often, uh, films, TV, video games, things that are involved in the kind of the pop culture and the zeitgeist of the world, but still very much but through the lens of performance. Um, while we do make up a bunch of product for lifestyle, our focus is on that of performance. So everything needs to kind of be funneled through that phase. Uh, it's a, it's a challenge at times because there's a lot of stuff in pop culture that's going on in the lifestyle space uh, with a lot of competitors uh, that we have. Obviously, what's going on with Kanye West is, is incredible and what they're doing is, is very intriguing, but that's not our business model. And it's never been the way that we approach it. So we are very, very athletically driven. And um, while we certainly respect our competitors, they just have a different point of view and they're much further along in their life cycle than ours. Yeah. So we are still uh, very focused. Well, it's interesting. I meet people in positions like that and you, you, I'm getting this air from you, I might be projecting, but I meet folks who are creatives, who started out as creatives, who executed creative work, but proved themselves to be really good at other stuff and had an ability to work inside of a corporate environment and get stuff done and then got promoted and at some point stopped having a direct hand in creative production. Am I in the neighborhood of your story? Or am I getting it totally um, wrong? Well, I don't know. I'd be happy to share my story because I'm one of the unique ones. Like, I, So I've been with the company, I guess, I was hired in September 2002, uh -huh. uh, over 15 and a half years ago. Obviously, we were a much smaller brand then. Yep. Um, and uh, the reality is I, I'm kind of in defiance of just about every normal rule that people have for how people progress through their career. Uh, I literally fell into the job, and I'll tell you that story in a second, but the reality is I have started at the bottom of the company. I started as a retail customer service person really? on the telephones. Really? Yes, and I'll, and I'll explain how I got there. Now, graduated from Towson University, degree in mass communications, uh, public relations, advertising, and if I'm being perfectly honest. And we hope um, you would be. What's that? We hope you would yeah, be. Yeah. Um, I'm wildly ahead of where I thought I would be maybe at this point in my life. That's not uh, saying I wasn't going to be successful or anything along those Jeremy, lines. Jeremy, we're all surprised by your success. <laughs> I'm no, surprised all, that I'm still functioning. We're all <laughs> astonished. Only in America. Yeah. That, <laughs> this is so true. Um, but I, uh, I graduated from college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do yeah. with my life. Not unlike a lot of us. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was bartending, waiting tables. Uh, it's, I, I've actually always argued that I've learned more waiting tables and bartending yeah. than I ever did in college. It was uh, in Baltimore? You were, it was in Baltimore, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, just outside That's a real Towson. place to bartend. That's not... Uh, well, yeah, you could call me a bar... I bartended at Don Pablo's. Oh, okay. 
I'm gonna dial back that. Uh, I don't know that I was yeah. exactly coyote ugly or yeah. something gritty. No, I'm, I'm trying I to frame you up as like hard. Or not, Look, you can frame me up as anything you want. The truth is, <laughs> I'll stop is that I'm, I'm, I'm not nearly as, as exciting as I might seem. But um, so. I'll be perfectly honest, when I got out of school, I didn't really know what the hell I wanted to do yep. with my life and where I wanted to go. I just knew that I wanted to do something that wasn't going to be TPS reports and, yep. and boredom. Right. Um, and, and the more interviews I went on, the more I realized I'm happy waiting tables and bartending. I mean, I, I was making great money doing it. And um, I think that it dawned on me at some point that waiting tables, bartending, they're noble positions, right? They're, there's nothing to be ashamed of about that, but I knew that knowing my personality, that if I didn't kind of get up and out, yeah. I was never going to leave. So I'm, I'm a talkative person. Uh, it's one thing that I've always yeah. leaned on and most teachers hated, but I've learned that they should have supported. So I'm trying to do that for my daughters now. But I had a regular at my tables that offered me a job, just really like my personality, he said, you should be in sales. And I said, you know what, I should be in sales. And he offered me a, a job as a sales manager for a contracting company, which is wildly ironic. Um, you know, I was a Jewish kid from the suburbs, like didn't even mow the lawn because I was allergic yeah. to cut grass. And, yeah. um, and the reality was, is that it wasn't really right for me, but I, it was offering me more money than I was making waiting tables and it got me out. Yeah. So it started me yeah. on a path. Um, well, being the completely clumsy moron that I am, I was out doing an estimate on a home, and uh, the ladder... Oh, where it the literally fell part. Oh, uh, I okay. literally yeah. fell into yeah. it, yes. Like, <laughs> and mind you, I, I want to be very clear, there's very few things on this planet that, dis that I despise more than people misuse of the word literally. Oh, uh, you I literally sat in traffic for 13 hours no, today? No, I figured oh, you did you really? Right. That's amazing. So it's 9 a.m., so you left last night at 8. So you're That's on a awesome. ladder. And the gutters that my ladder was leaned against were bolted into rotten wood. And the ladder collapsed. I went with it and I shattered my wrist. And I'm, those of you at home can't see it now, but I'm showing them scars on my arm. Yeah. I had a big metal bar attaching it. And it dawned on me like, holy crap, I don't have insurance. Yeah. I don't have, I was like, this is not a way to live life. And so I asked my girlfriend at the time, uh, who is now my wife, um, to go get me a newspaper across the street. So mind you, this is like 2000, summer 2002. Mm -hmm. Go across the street and get me a newspaper. And started looking through A's, B's, C's, and saw customer service. Well, I worked at Gap in high school. I've been waiting tables and bartending for years, sales. It's really ultimately customer service. Uh, I'm gonna apply for this job right here because it said fully paid employer benefits. Yep. And I would love to tell you that I went and chased down Under Armour because I felt that they were going to be something amazing. At that point, I hadn't even heard of them, to be perfect, to heard of us. Um, well, in fairness, I hadn't either. It well, a long uh, time ago. Right, this was a long time ago. Yeah. So to give you an, an idea of like size and scope, they offered me a job on, on, on the spot for $24,000 a year. So obviously not making uh, very much money, but I had insurance. And now maybe had a path, I don't know. But I was on the phone with little Johnny, little Susie, and little Susie and Johnny's mom, where they kept asking me about this Armor All stuff, or people calling it Under Armoire, or yeah. any number of things. At the time, we had 12 products in five colors. That was literally all we had. Um, and uh, we've evolved quite a bit. That year, uh, in January, we culminated 55 million in sales, and this past year, we've been over four billion. Um, obviously tremendous growth. It's been an amazing journey. But I was hired as a retail customer service person, which was a really interesting opportunity because I was dealing with the end user. Yeah. I wasn't dealing with the, the retailers who are also right. dealing with other brands who really at the end of it, whether they sell somebody a Nike shoe or an Under Armour shirt or what have you, uh, at the end of it, as a retailer, their job is to sell a product and keep products turning, it, whether it's Under Armour or Nike they, 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 or, or Adidas or any other brand, it didn't really matter at that point. But when you're talking to the end user, it matters. And so it was this amazing experience for me to really start getting into kind of like the minds of who uses our product, even in our like most early nascent days, like who uses our product? And it really helped me kind of get in tune with that. So as the product line evolved, I really understood who we were going after and, and how we were getting there. And um, that first day, 
uh, I had, uh, you know, here I was, first job, I actually had to wear khakis to work, which was mind-blowing. Um, and this was back in the phenomenal pleated pant days. Oh, yeah. Uh, just yeah. terrible. Yeah. And um, so here I am, young guy, but probably old for his first job at this point, 25, and I kind of sitting in my chair, I'm getting acquainted, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee, and I spin out of my chair, and I just pop up, and like right out of some movie out of the 80s, I collide with somebody, and papers just go flying in the air everywhere. I look at the person, he doesn't really smirk, but I smirk because I'm kind of a wise ass. Both of us give each other a look, bent down at the exact same time, connect skulls. At that point, I start laughing, hold my head up. The other person is not laughing. And I was like, man, I'm so sorry. My name's Jeremy, it's my first day. And he says, my name's Kevin. I sign your checks. Um, and so that's how Kevin Plank and I met. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of violence in yeah, your tra personal trajectory story. Is that well, you know, I, I, I think that that's okay, though. But I don't know I if do violence too. is as much the right word as maybe just a whole bunch of... Uh, Physically just, painful. Uh, uh, well, what's the Buddhist point of view? Like, life is pain, right? Of course. Not such a bad yeah. thing. Yeah. So, um, but that's how I met Kevin. And Kevin has, uh, he, he obviously given that set of structures, he never forgot my name. And over the, the years, I've been wildly fortunate to call him a friend and a mentor. Um, I've had exposure to a tremendous amount of things. Um, and I'm not going to dive into all of it because that's a story for another day. But over time, about, I was in that position there for about 14 months, really learning the brand, learning the product line, learning yeah. the direction that we were heading and what was on the horizon. And uh, at that point, I had met uh, somebody who at that point was our director of marketing. And he likes, to, he likes to say that I stalked him. I like to say that he affectionately says that I stalked him. Um, but I would send him notes incessantly. Like all of a sudden, I had a degree in mass communications, public relations and advertising. Uh, I was in a place that seemed special, but I really couldn't put my finger on it. And my girlfriend at the time, again, now my wife, uh, who said, so they sell tight t-shirts, right? And she's like thinking to herself, great, so I'm gonna yeah. be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be leaving this guy pretty soon, I have a feeling. Um, but it, obviously on the surface, it sounded crazy, right? I, I, I won't dispute that. Looking back, I think that some of the best ideas on earth probably started with somebody going, yeah, this is crazy, let's do yeah. it. Um, so I get brought, uh, I, I keep sending uh, the gentleman an email saying, how can I help? What can I do? Like, there's gotta be emails I can return for you, calls I can make, research I can do, what have you. I just, I wanted to move into the marketing department. Well, and it's, it's interesting because it seems like something's flipped here where this story begins with somebody who doesn't totally have a plan, is kind of happy, or at least uh, likes aspects of bartending, serving tables, kind of gets discovered, changes life a little bit. And, and the coming to Under Armour was very much about insurance. It was like really, really practical. 100%. There's this accidental meeting with this important person. Very and, serendipitous. And the version of you post head bump seems very intentional. Like there's something here, I want to be a part of it, I want to move and up. And that's exactly wanna, right. Like, yeah. I always tell my daughters, um, you know, look, opportunity knocks for all of us. Every last one of us. It doesn't always head. literally bang you on the head, but well, this is true. Knock. This is true. But I will say that it's always knocks, and typically it locks pretty loud. The, the reality is that sometimes, no matter how somebody, loud somebody's knocking, you might be in the basement and you can't hear them. Yeah. Right? Like, and the truth of the matter is, I think that a lot of people don't realize what they have, right? It's, it's like this whole notion of, of, uh, of being aware when it's happening. You know, later in life, as I've discovered different tools and the like, it's a lot of, a lot of it's, you know, being mindful um, of knowing well, when it's actually happening. Yeah, and there's two sides to that, and I think there's something listeners can probably pick up on or maybe already have in Kevin in meeting somebody, getting semi-stalked by them. Well, this is different. So that wasn't Kevin that I was stalking. I met Kevin and then well, but Kevin's <laughs> I was stalking involved. somebody completely Kevin's different. Involved. <laughs> but, but Kevin's involved in a process where, where here's a person who is in a really low-level role to begin with, but is gifted and has a lot of passion. It probably doesn't look exactly like what they thought they'd hire for the next. It probably doesn't act like it, probably doesn't talk exactly like it. 
but sees that passion, sees that ingenuity, sees that self-reliance and says, you know what, let's, let's have that guy do it. Let's, let's well, I think there was a little bit of that. There was a lot of, um, of blood, sweat, and tears and, and, yeah. pay, and, and paying my dues and yeah. earning my keep. Now, there was, man, this is something that could, uh, I, I mean, I could talk about my, my history here for, for Well, it's a six and a half a hour podcast. Time. Okay, well, this is perfect. Let me take up. my shoes off. Um, so. No, but the reality is, is that I just, there was something inside that felt right. Yeah. Um, it felt comfortable. It felt risky. Yeah. But not enough risk that like that you start getting like anxious. It was more like, man, what could this be? Yeah. What could this be? And like, and at the time, like, I never thought that we'd be. I like to use this line that that Kevin uses, and and he's right. Like people would say to him, they'd say, "So, do you ever think it'd be like this?" And his answer, it's it's pretty, it's pretty spot on in my opinion, because I I guess I kind of feel the same way. And he's like, I don't know that I ever thought it'd be like this. Yeah. But I don't know that I didn't. Yeah. You know, like it's like I think that we didn't put guardrails on what could be. Yeah. Um, and one of the lines, you know, Kevin has a ton of mantras, uh, lines that he uses, and this has always been one of my favorites. So it'll kind of make your mind melt. But it's it's I've always been smart. We've always been smart enough to be naive enough to not know what we couldn't accomplish. <laughs> I think the what? easiest run lay that, person way to define run that, that back is, one more time, a little more slowly. We've always been smart enough to be naive enough to not know what we couldn't accomplish. I like it. So the idea there is, and I think that the, the most visual way I could represent it is, I don't know how old you are or what people even are in touch with at this point, but I, I look at it as the Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons. That's what I call it yeah. my Roadrunner theory. So if you remember, Roadrunner would go running and the Coyote would be chasing him and somehow manage to keep up and the Roadrunner would always hit a cliff Yep. And it would run across and it would get to the other side. Yep. And the coyote would do the same thing, but he would stop in the middle. Because he, he would look he at the camera. Correct. He would look at the camera for a second. You'd hear his blinks, the ding, ding. And then he would look down. And what happens when he looked down? He would fall. He would fall. But one could easily argue that if he never stopped in that middle and looked at the camera and then looked Make down, he would have made it to the other side. So I think that you have to kind of like throw caution in the wind and say like, why not? Yeah. Like there's absolutely no reason. The world is littered with people that didn't follow dreams or, or, or didn't kind of lay it out there. Well, we, we talk a lot about beneficial irrationality on the That's pod, right? You know, this idea that if there, not a lot of MBAs make great entrepreneurs because they've learned why it shouldn't work. I made a conscious decision to not go to business yeah. school. And, and what I love about your story and thinking big picture about Under Armour is there's a theme of that, right? There's, there's something coming together at a micro and a macro level that is um, facing the future without this really predictive sense of what it ought to be, but is more about hard work and whatever's next. And that's exactly right. Like, I mean, we can sit and we can plan out what our lives are supposed to be, but no matter what that outcome is, it will always be different than what you plan in your head. Maybe worse, maybe better, maybe exactly yeah. neutral, you, it doesn't matter, but it just won't be exactly as you played it out. You didn't You're know not you were going to be life. talking to me 10 minutes ago. Uh, literally, here we so are. I'm completely <laughs> unprepared. I mean, I'm... I'm well, let's shift gears here just a little bit. I want to cover a couple more things and then, and then um, get you out of here. One is... You know, we've gone through the big job title, we've gone through the story. What I know is very essential to your job is um, having an appreciation of innovation and applicability of technology, of Absolutely. methodologies to reach people. Mm -hmm. Without getting too far in the weeds, tell us a little bit about how you think about that. How do you separate the good stuff from the fads? How do you judge whether or not you want to partner with somebody? What, what guides that decision-making process for you? You know, I think the word that, that helps describe my career in many ways is serendipity. Um, like, and I think that a lot of that goes with partnerships as well. Um, you know, right place, right time, right opportunity. And the great thing about my world is, is it's not necessarily being used to drive a campaign mm -hmm. or anything. It's really about just connection and making sure that your brand is thought of not only in the lane that it lives in. Right, because here's the reality. We are an athletically oriented brand, but that does not mean that is all our products can do. Mm -hmm. Right, like, and, and it's very simple, right? So, and, and the great thing about athletics in general is you can be an athlete, and that can be how you define yourself, 
or you can be a dad, or you can be a husband or a friend or a coworker or whatever, but you also do athletic things. And that doesn't even mean that you have to hit the gym or be a hardcore workout. Like you go out on trail walks on the weekend, you ride your bike with your, with your, with your, with your, with your kids or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Like everybody has athletic aspects of their life. And so when doing that, we've already got certain things locked down. Right? We're going to be in your sporting goods channels. We're going to yeah. be on your kid's team. We're going to be in all these places. But how do we start bringing over into the world of yeah. the people that aren't playing those sports but are still active individuals? Where are they spending their time? Well, sure, watching TV, of course, uh, films. Now, mind you, 15 years ago, it's crazy to even think about, but like 15 years ago, the web's not nearly what it is right now. Like the, the wild swings and changes that have happened in that time are, are overwhelming. And that's, as, as marketers, all of us know that that's, it's a mess of a world to live in. It's exciting, but it is, it's, it's just a big jumbled mess and you kind of have to weed through that stuff. So a lot of that comes down to finding their opportunities that just feel right, right? And, and I'm not always out kind of like hitting the pavement trying to find things, but when it clicks, it clicks. And when it makes sense, it makes sense. Um, and a lot of my job started, well, once I moved into the marketing department, um, I was brought in as an assistant to the director of marketing, which means I was answering a lot of calls, yeah. which means I was getting a lot of cold calls for a young brand that people just weren't sure to talk to. And, and again, showing my age here, but I always kind of looked at myself as Mikey from the life commercials. Like yeah. when you didn't know where it should go, just give it to Mikey. Yeah. Mike will eat it. Mikey will eat anything. Yeah. Like, and that's, and that was me, yeah. right? Like I, I would field these calls. And I remember like the first call I ever got on a product placement front was from Boone and Murray Productions. And they were working at the time on a, and a rel it wasn't year one, but it was one of the early years of the, what at the time was called the real world road rules challenge. Mm -hmm. And they needed uniforms. Well, I had a background in ordering product. The team in marketing didn't have really any interest in doing anything there, but they just needed product for their show. I knew how to order it, but didn't necessarily have permission to order it, but I was intrigued and they didn't need that much and I sent out a bunch of product. Well, four months later on MTV, there's our logo yeah. popping up. Like, and now customer service is getting calls. Like, it's it like, it kind of, pardon my French, but holy shit, this stuff yep. works. Um, yep. And so what started as a very basic, hey, I'll give you product in return for exposure, turned into let's develop relationships and let's evolve that into years later, working with people like uh, Legendary on, on the Dark Knight Rises and, and being able yeah. to outfit this football team in this really sticky scene where Bane blows the field up and we were able to take this product line around this fictitious Gotham Rogues team and work with Warner Brothers and work with their licensing team and build out this like beautiful product line that came out at the same time. Now we weren't able to promote that because we made a conscious decision not to after unfortunate situation that happened in Aurora yep. with the killings. Yep. We weren't capitalizing on that but what we found was this moment in the film that people were still going to see, the product sold out in 36 hours because yeah. if it's good and it's sticky, like Meg in, said in our, in our presentation earlier, you know, it's a little field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Well, what I love about that too, particularly going back to the, um, the original example, when you were fielding cold calls, it's somebody that's got layered experience that's multi-dimensional, that didn't exclusively self-identify as a marketer, mm -hmm. who because of that could see an opportunity where somebody else might not have. I think well, it's true. I, I think that that's, that's a challenge that a lot of us face. Yeah. Um, you get put into a lane, yeah. you get put into, you have these guardrails, and what basically happens yeah. at that point is you have, you're just, you're, you're put into a box. And when you're put into that box, like, yeah, you can be successful within it, but when you have the ability to roam and find some different connection points and look at things from a different angle, it changes the scope. And to me, it is an incredibly challenging thing to do even internally because a lot of what I do doesn't make sense on the surface because everybody's so focused on their campaigns and driving, okay, we are coming out with a new shoe. We need to make sure that shoe sells where I'm looking at it from the perspective of if I'm finding interesting partnerships for the brand, not necessarily around a particular product, 
that's going to give you lift in another area. And just know that whatever you're doing over here it, is just It is may just not fit accented. on your spreadsheet, but it does work. Exactly. Right? It it's an amplification a method. I love it. Uh, last thing, we'll do it quickly. Headquartered, you live and work in Baltimore, Maryland, I correct? Do. Balmer? Uh, I'm actually a Baltimore guy, but Balmer is, okay. uh, is definitely a... I grew up in the D.C. area, so I'm still very much that side. But I love making fun of our accent as do much as you, everybody. And I can't do it. Scott Van Pelt can do it pretty well. I can't do it. But bon, do you? <laughs> on, yeah, Scott, Scott's a friend of the brand. He's a great guy. Yeah. SVP can do it. Um, do you self-identify as somebody who lives in the southern United States? <laughs> well, we're below the Mason-Dixon line. So You're I guess by definition, yes. But You're do I, I? Man, I've always, I think that don't everybody. Do you or not? Come no, on. I don't. I don't. Wow. I do not, and I'll tell you why. Do you live in what? Do you believe you live in the northern United States? I. It's a great. I don't think about North South to be honest with what you. It, so do you think Mid Atlantic is like? This? I think Mid Atlantic, honestly. It's a yeah, thing. I think. Yeah, it definitely is. Thing well, it's like this. Like thing. if somebody asked me if I was white, I'd say no, I'm Jewish. <laughs> like, and and the reality is, is I'm not even really Jewish. Like, so it's. It's what are you going to do? But like the, the truth of the okay. matter, yeah, I'm a very complicated <laughs> individual. But the truth of the matter is, um, like, most people think I'm from New York, and I could totally see that, but I'm not. I'm just a mouthy dude from the yeah, suburbs of that, D.C. Yeah, that feels like a superficial read. So, but you're in the, because we like to organize this with guests, so sure. you believe there is a thing in between North and South called Mid-Atlantic that I is definitely a unique do. region. Definitely do. What are the boundaries of it? Uh, I mean, it, it's Maryland, D.C., Virginia. Uh, Northern Virginia, that is. Okay. Like, honestly. Like, okay. I mean, I guess the you DMV. could say Southern. Yeah, the DMV. That's exactly right. okay. it, man. I hear you. Okay, yeah. we can stand by that. Jeremy Brody, director of a lot of stuff. I know it involves <laughs> partnerships and entertainment. Sorry, I've been all over the place here. Not I, at like all. Like I said, I found out 10 minutes I would, I would ask on. you to plug the brand, but everybody knows it. Everybody loves it. It's found everywhere. It's under well, armor. Thank you for that. joining us. The best is yet to come. That I can assure you. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to South Pod, Rise of a Region, where innovators dish on success, failure, and a rapidly evolving South.